We're doing a tier list today on all the Pixar movies released so far. I think there's like 26 of them, so this will stay relevant for at least another week. Pixar makes some of the greatest animated films full stop, in my opinion, of course. So even though there might be one or two films in the trash category, that's only specific to Pixar. With that intro out of the way, let's get, oh my God, Woody's here from Toy Story. How did I forget? Thank you for reminding me. Woody says you should subscribe to the channel, Adam Does Movies, because I post tons of movie and TV show related content each and every week. Would love to have you. Woody would love to have you as well. Oh, he's getting a Woody just thinking about it. Here are the categories. In the top spot, God tier, we have to infinity and beyond. Next up is Kachow, which means the film's awesome. In the watchable category, we have Falling with Style. In the disappointing spot, just keep swimming. And last and certainly least, there's the hot trash category, put that thing back where it came from. And yes, these are all quotes from Pixar films. I'm a movie guy. Let's talk about the first Pixar movie ever released, Toy Story. This is infinity levels of awesome. It started everything. It was amazing to see in theaters. And yes, the CG, not the greatest, but it still holds up. Still very watchable in that aspect. Plus you got Randy Newman narrating different emotions that the toys are going through. You have a fun, playful concept. You have America's sweetheart, Tom Hanks. You have Tim the Tool Man Allen, not Taylor. He uses a different last name in Home Improvement for reasons I can't possibly comprehend. This was not only the perfect launching point for Pixar, but also 3D animated films in general. It was, it was mind blowing. That's all I can say. Let's move on to the next one. What do you say about a film that's completely forgettable? I'm being too rough on this, but honestly, I haven't given a second thought to Bugs Life since I saw it in theaters a thousand years ago. Outside of American sweetheart, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, there's really no voices here that really stand out for me either. I mean, Kevin Spacey does play the villain, which, that seems pretty par for the course at this point. To its credit, A Bug's Life does look nicer than Toy Story. They definitely gave it a bump in the graphics department. I think Randy Newman's back as well, because that, I guess, is a requirement for Pixar in the early phase. But outside of that, this was a step down. Still a fine film, just nothing more. When I think of movie sequels that not only match the quality of the original, but even surpassed, I look at films like Aliens, like Terminator 2, like Home Alone 2 Lost in New York. Yes, it's better than the first. I don't want to hear any nays about it. And Toy Story 2, the superior Toy Story film. This is another God tier. This is another Infinity and Beyond movie. I've seen it multiple times. You have a great story fleshing out these toys better, which is funny because they don't have flesh. But I'm not using that word in the literal sense. You should know that. I shouldn't have to explain myself to you. We have fun new characters. We have a great backstory featuring Woody's Roundup. And we even get to find out who Buzz Lightyear's father is. Chilling stuff. Very chilling stuff. This is a great movie. Really tugs at the heartstrings. Really draws you in with the updated effects. Randy Newman's back, baby. He never left. Yeah, Toy Story 2. This is where it's at. Man was early Pixar amazing. Monsters Inc. This is top shelf shit. Another brilliant film playing off a child's imagination. In this case, it's not toys coming to life, it's that monster under your bed or the one peeking out of the closet. But on the other side of that door, a fully operational world where monsters exist and they make their energy by scaring kids. John Goodman and Billy Crystal are a dynamic duo here, bouncing hilarious dialogue off one another, trying to get to the bottom of a mystery going on inside of Monsters, Inc., and coming to the conclusion that there are better ways to harness power. The final moments of the picture will make even the most alpha of men shed a tear. The film is beautiful. From top to bottom, it's, it's infinity level. When is this train gonna slow down? Another infinity level picture here with Finding Nemo. The story of a clownfish named Marlin, who's ironically not funny at all, and his attempts to track down his son Nemo, who's lying in a fish tank in a dentist's office. Comedian Ellen DeGeneres plays Dory, absolutely steals every scene she's in. There's sharks that don't eat meat. I, there's just so many creative ideas on display here, and the visuals at the time, Holy crap, were they stunning. It's also classic Disney, in the sense that it kills off a parent right away. That's a good way to get the heart pumping, right? If you want your kids to grow up real fast, you show them the first couple minutes of Finding Nemo. 
That shit hits hard. The Iron Giant Master himself, Brad Bird, delivers another infinity level picture with The Incredibles. This is still one of my top favorite animated movies of all time. You've probably heard it a million times, but this really is the Fantastic Four movie we've all been waiting for. Brad Bird takes the superhero premise, flips it on his head. Superheroes are banned because they cause too much destruction. So we have a family here trying to make ends meet and subdue their superpowers. Don't run too fast. Don't use force fields. Just don't feel Elsa. I think us guys, especially in middle age now, can all relate to Craig T. Nelson as Bob. He just wants something more than his mediocre life, and he's willing to get out there, even hide it from his wife, in order to just live again. And like all wives that genuinely care, She's pissed when she finds out what he's been up to, but at the end of the day, they have to work together as a family to get out of a bad situation and take out one of the greatest supervillains in a movie, Syndrome. Jason Lee voices Buddy to perfection, a sidekick wannabe who grows up to become a supervillain. Across the board, the execution is flawless. It's just a shame all these years later we would get a sequel that wouldn't live up to the hype. There's a fan base for Cars. I'm not in that fan base. <laughs> I'm also not a fan of Larry the Cable Guy's humor. So him being Mater wasn't really the perfect match for me. I do like Owen Wilson. Okay, I'm, I'm a fan of Owen Wilson, but this movie was just too slow and I wasn't interested in the NASCAR stuff. There wasn't enough racing for me. Just a lot of cars chatting and it was a very small, simple film. I felt like I was lied to in the initial marketing, but even upon rewatching it, I just, don't find it that interesting. Watchable, certainly, and that's why it's going in the falling with style category. I believe Ratatouille is another Brad Bird movie and he brings me back. We ventured off course into Cars territory, clearly aimed at a younger audience, but now we're back in action with Ratatouille. This is another one that's infinity levels of good. I can watch this film over and over again, but I'm also a sucker for the art form of cooking. Something that I'm not great at, but in a different life, man, I would have loved to have been a chef. If I had any sort of skill set at all. I would have followed that dream. I would have chased that dream down. What's brilliant about this movie is Brad Bird takes one of the grossest animals on the planet, marries it with culinary design. What really puts my favorite Pixar movies in that infinity category is the ending, when it all comes together so nicely. And in this case, we have a critic, a food critic, who's not impressed with the restaurant resting on its laurels. Is it laurels? Laurels? What do rats rest on? Regardless, the food critic, appropriately named Ego, has not been impressed. He hasn't been wowed by anything coming out of restaurants lately. That is, until he tries Remy's Ratatouille, and he's taken back to when he was a kid. It brought feelings and emotions out of him. Just this food, this simple meal. It's a fantastic movie with an exquisite message. That's why it's at the top. I love this movie full stop. It's quirky, it's charming, it's different. The premise is so wackadoo, yet it works perfectly. In the future, Earth is declared uninhabitable, so the humans all launch off into a giant spacecraft that's basically run by Walmart, while a soul robot is left behind to clean up the mess. During his daily route, he stumbles upon a single blade of grass that has grown. Life can be sustained again. This triggers an Eve robot to drop down, scan it, bring it back to the ship, in which case humans are gonna be sent back. Except for they're not, because the AI has gotten too smart for that. They're not letting these people go home. Inside of this heavy plot is the real story, which is one of love, between a junked out PC and a beautiful slick Mac. They will traverse the shitty remains of Earth. They will slow dance in space, and they will in fact, fall in love. From a visual standpoint, there's a lot going on too. Wally, -E, the Earth, even the president at the beginning is very lifelike. I mean, the president is in fact a real human. So when we see the contrast up in the ship of these giant blobby remains of the human race, there's nothing natural looking about them. They're very cartoonish in nature. And that's the point. We have more of a connection now with that rusty old robot than we do with the sloths sitting on that computer all day. And what does it take for them to wake up and see what's really going on? Not human connection, just any connection. And that happens to come from Wally. -E. It's a deep film, it's beautiful, great score, cinematography's top of the line. I can't say enough good things about Wally. -E.
Up is one of those instances for me where the beginning and the ending are knocked out of the freaking stratosphere, but in the middle, it's pretty rough. For the beginning and ending alone though, I still put it in Kachow territory, but it really could have hit infinity levels had it just had a bit more structure in the middle. It gets very silly, too silly, especially when I see dogs flying planes with bone chew toys. I drew the line there. There are some really colorful characters here though, both human and animal alike. And I do give this studio props for telling a story about an older person. We just don't really see them in the spotlight that often. Not since the Grumpy Old Men franchise have I been very captivated by an old dude really doing anything. So bravo to the studio for this. A lot of people would put Toy Story 3 right at the top of their list. I'm not a lot of people. And honestly, I kind of disagree. I am gonna put it in Kachow but it's barely Kachow material. I find the movie overall to be too dark. And yes, I mean that in the literal sense, it's just nighttime too often. I don't wanna watch a Toy Story, let alone an animated movie that takes place mostly at night. It's not interesting to me. And the story is also very grim. Hey, let's throw toys in an incinerator. What the hell is happening? This is for kids. And I understand kids grow up, so the people that watch Toy Story 1 are you know, me, but I still don't want to see that. I like the fantasy, I like the childhood whimsy that's involved. The best parts of Toy Story 3 are with Lotso causing havoc in the daycare. The toys trying to get away, using creative ideas and concepts. Watching them almost burn alive while holding hands, singing Kumbaya, not my idea of a good Toy Story movie. That said, it all comes back around at the end, we get acceptance, we get moving on. Andy is growing up, he's going to college. Woody needs to move on too. Find that new kid to play with. Let a kid play with the Woody like Andy. And I hear how it's coming out, that's intentional. We have our first put that thing back where it came from trash film with Cars 2. I didn't even finish this movie. Now. Maybe it gets really good, but from what I saw, I had so little interest it was remarkable. The first movie was a drag for me to get through. So I thought, hey, a spy movie in the Cars universe? That seems like a better direction. I just didn't care. So I can't really speak much to this film because again, I only made it probably 20 minutes in and I just, I, it's the only Pixar movie I haven't watched through to completion. So that should say everything you need to know. Last and Kinda least on my list is Brave. Not as bad as Cars 2 because I finished it, but not a whole lot better. Again, Pixar playing on the tropes, flipping the script. Instead of the princess turning into a creature, the mother does. And it's not gonna be a magical kiss that's gonna get her out of this. It's gonna be them learning to accept each other for who they are. Faults and everything. We have a red-headed princess here, so there's some props for that. I know the redhead community often feels uh, kinda left in the dust. So it's nice when they get some representation. It's funny because Pixar goes against one trope, but then they use another one, which is the strong female lead with the bow and arrow. How, how many times have we seen this? How many times can we do this with the woman? It's always the bow and arrow. Visually speaking, I'm not really a fan of this one either. I think when it came out, it kind of wowed people with its hyper-realistic look. There was obviously some style to it, but looking back on it now, it just doesn't really sit that well with me. I was gonna put this in the Just Keep Swimming category because it's not like awful or anything, but honestly, I don't ever wanna watch it again. If, if someone wanted me to watch it, I don't think I would. So yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and put that thing back where it came from. John Goodman and Billy Crystal are back, baby, as everyone's favorite scarers. I don't know if that's a word, but we're going with it. It's Monsters, Inc. 2, this time appropriately titled Monsters University, because it's a prequel. And usually prequels don't work, like 100% of the time, but this film defies the odds. It's a fun romp around the campus, featuring not just these two lovable furry friends, but we have some other cameos from favorites from the first film. The film is like old school, but for kids. No, it's not as serious, as dark, or has the touching ending the first film does, but it's something different. It's not your traditional sequel where it takes what works from the first one and just kind of repeats it. It's its own film and I appreciate that. I'm giving it a kachow. Inside Out, as a prepubescent girl, this film really speaks to me. In all seriousness, this is Pixar getting back to what made them great. 
taking chances, trying new things, telling an original story. I can actually connect since Riley grew up in Minnesota and she's leaving that state behind, which is actually what I did. Were my emotions popping off like crazy? Not the same ones as her, but uh, I definitely had joy. I had sadness. And I think everyone that watches this movie can relate on some level to Riley and what she's going through. And Pixar's really good at making films for all ages. Except for maybe the scary ass clown. That, that could maybe give a couple kids nightmares and adults. I'm not saying I woke up in the middle of the night from fever sweats, but I'm not not saying that either. Let me get real with you for a second, Pixar. Do you have to do it? Do you have to kill Bing Bong? Never forget. Colorful characters check, a beautiful score, you better believe it Buster, and an ending so powerful that wraps everything together in a nice package gives us an easy to infinity and beyond score. The good dinosaur? More like the bad dinosaur. Subscribe. What's really weird is The Good Dinosaur and Inside Out came out in the same year, like a few months apart from one another. It's like Pixar took all the bad ideas they had and went ahead and put it in the dinosaur picture. We have a cowboy T-Rex. We got a Triceratops that's just quirky and out there and doesn't talk. And we have a protagonist so unlikable, so klutzy, so completely inept. It's like Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump fused into one creation. Nobody likes it. Ellen DeGeneres is really great as a supporting actress. Really great as a supporting actress. Not so much when she has to carry an entire picture. I'm being harsh on this one. Finding Dory is just as good. No, it's not. It's not just as good as Finding Nemo. It's still good though. Pixar once again managed to take a concept that worked in the first movie and not do the same thing again. Make it fresh enough to keep me invested. I appreciate that they built an entire story around Dory's disability and how she was able to overcome it by the end. And seeing this film as a parent with my children, I mean, that was heart-wrenching stuff. As the mother and father are laying out rocks, trying to get her back home, searching an entire ocean for her, seeing Dory trying to remember and getting frustrated at her and with her that she has no idea what she ate for breakfast let alone who her parents are anymore. It's tragic stuff, only told in a way Pixar could tell it. While it doesn't hit that same crescendo Finding Nemo does, it doesn't fall that short either. I'm giving this a ka-chow. If you didn't like Cars 1 and hated Cars 2, Cars 3 says hold my gear because it's awful. Cars 3 is set up like the perfect underdog story to a movie that Pixar didn't finish making because as this film starts to wind down, Lightning McQueen takes a back seat. Instead of McQueen finishing the race, taking on his rival, and proving that he still has what it takes to win, the whole movie's thrown in reverse. And his protege comes in last second, clutch, and wins the thing for him. Awful. Awful. I mean, the film kind of had it all. It had a Days of Thunder opening, where McQueen's wrecked, has to get back into fighting shape. It had a Rocky Balboa montage, including a, a nice run on the beach. And it had the final high octane, in your face, edge of your seat action, only to end in a dismal rope-a-dope where the audience is sold short. It last Jedi'd us. That's what happened here. We were sold a bill of goods and we received absolute crap. Why am I still talking about this movie? It is a put that thing back where it came from. Coco is footloose. But in Mexico, when a young boy named Miguel is unable to play music like he wanted to, like his ancestors did before him, he goes ahead and finds them. Of course, the big thing that separates Coco from the other Pixar movies on this list is the cultural significance it has. It takes place in Mexico, we learn of the Day of the Dead, and it really gives us an insight in not just the culture of the Mexican people, but also the beauty behind it. They don't grieve loss, instead, they celebrate it. The message of the film is easily the selling point for it. Of course, the visuals are great, the music is lovely, it's fine. I found myself kind of wandering off in the middle. The movie feels like it pads itself out just to get to that ending, which is one of the best in Pixar history. I wept like a grown baby. So this is kind of like up for me, where the beginning really is fantastic and the ending knocks it out of the park, but the middle could have used some work. I'm giving this a ka-chow. Remember the plot of The Incredibles? If you don't, you can just watch Incredibles 2. It's the same exact movie. Remember when I praised the Pixar sequels for not doing the exact same thing the previous one did? 
Incredibles 2 does the exact same thing. Instead of Bob being the one to secretly go out and get work for the family, Helen's doing it. She's the one away from the kids. Bob has to take over the house. The kids have barely progressed at all outside of little Jack-Jack becoming more adorable and more awesome with his powers. It just took so long for Brad Bird to make this movie, and I had such high hopes it would be amazing again. The villain couldn't have been more obvious unless she spray-painted I am the villain across her chest, and she has nothing on Buddy. Buddy is one of the greatest villains in movie history. She's just nothing compared to him. I forgot her name too, but it's like super obvious. It's like Cruella DeVille or something. Uh, Evelyn DeVore, it just sounds evil. All things considered, the first film is essentially flawless. So even copying that and getting close to the goodness that was Incredibles is a lofty goal all by itself. So I am gonna give this a kachow, but it's a sad kachow. It's a whimper, not a exclamation. I remember liking Toy Story 4 when I saw it in theaters, but upon reflection, I can't remember a single thing about it outside of Bo Peep is back. Looks completely different. Penguin's still MIA. What happened to the penguin? Remember the, the penguin with the bad voice box? Talking about random side characters because I just don't have much to say about this film. Looks beautiful. I think we can say that. But as we get up this list, or down, whichever way you're going on this roller coaster ride, the visuals are gonna keep getting better. That, that should go without saying. Technology improves. Now that doesn't mean style improves necessarily, but for a film like Toy Story, they already have that style in the bag. So the gloss is gonna get glossier, the cloth is gonna get clothier. Still haven't said anything about the movie. Keanu Reeves is in there, he plays a daredevil. Key and Peele are in there, they're kind of annoying, which is sad because those guys are hilarious usually. I did find it a bit puzzling, borderline troubling that Bonnie can create life by merely taking an object and combining another object with it via glue or a paper clip. I mean, this is a power that no kid should wield. I couldn't even imagine the amount of toys she's killed along the way by accidentally throwing a couple of objects together, having them stick in the garbage can. Frightening stuff. This could have been a horror film. It's kind of another movie where Woody has to let go again, but instead this time he lets go of his friends. Goes off in adventures with Bo Peep and uh, the rest of them go back for playtime. I don't know, it just felt a little disingenuous. It felt like it almost jumped ahead another trilogy's worth of content and said, Woody's done, he's hanging up the towel, he's ready to start his own life. Because he was really only with Bonnie for two minutes at the end of Toy Story 3, and then a couple side stories that were released on Disney Plus or cable for some reason. It's definitely a watchable movie. I don't think it's Kachow though, I think I'm gonna put it in Falling with Style. Yeah, that, that seems fair. That seems right. Have you ever seen a Dwayne Johnson, Kevin Hart film? I think everybody has. They've been in 30 of them together. This is kind of that, except for with Chris Pratt and Tom Holland. Onward's an appropriate title for this picture because I just wanted to move onward from it. <laughs> it's not my best. Onward was the least Pixar movie Pixar's ever made. Nothing really creative about it, very mid, as the kids would say. It's like a Dungeons and Dragons movie set at the library. It, it's boring. It's not entertaining, but it should be. It's got dragons, it's got swords, it's got traps. How was this a miss? It's a good question I just asked myself, and honestly, I don't know the answer. I'm gonna give this a just keep swimming, because I don't want to see you anymore. Not you, the, the movie. We have entered the Disney Plus section of Pixar. It started with Onward. It continues with Soul, a film that's oddly lacking in one. It had such a cool concept too. A piano teacher that really wanted to play in the big leagues, be in a band, entertain people live on stage, and right when he gets his big break, he gets his big break. Breaks his neck, goes up to Soul World, where he meets Tina Fey. Now, if I were him personally, I'd stay dead because Tina Fey is a queen, and I would gladly spend an eternity with her. But again, he has different plans in mind. He wants to get back to Earth, snap back to reality. Whoop, there goes gravity. Things don't work out that way. He goes into the body of a cat. She goes into his comatose body on the bed. And this is where the film completely falls apart. Now we do a body swap thing? They Freaky Friday this thing. They parent trap this thing. They probably 15 other shows on Disney at some point this thing. I hated it. The final act kind of brings it back, but at that point I'm already so checked out. It has a hippie up in the clouds going, whoa, dude, let's see if we can get you back. I hate hippies, they've never been funny. Sorry I'm yelling. I'm just honestly upset and disappointed. Film of course looks gorgeous. Music, top of the line. 
I wish I could play the piano. Honestly, I do. I've tried. I have piano fingers. Well, besides this one that's like jacked up and broken, but that's a story for a different time. <laughs> Probably a better story than the one I saw in this film. This is gonna get a Just Keep Swimming. Here we are with another Disney Plus exclusive, Luca. And this time, they got it right for me. I'm a big fan of this film. I like the quaintness of it. Off on an adventure in the Italian countryside with two young kids getting up to some misadventures. The only difference between these two boys and other boys is they have freaking fins and scales and gills. These are gills, if you didn't know. The movie has a lot of fun with this too. They kind of do a gremlins thing where whenever they're wet, part of their body transforms, but then snaps back again really quickly. The movie's very playful, features a great ensemble cast, but it's the things that aren't set out loud in this picture that really make it stand out for me. Clearly, Alberto's got a couple skeletons in his closet or just some deep-seated emotions he's not ready to share yet. Alberto's a phenomenal character. And again, by the end of this movie, I'm in a heap a full-grown sob in the corner of the couch, not wanting the rest of my family to look at me because I'm choking up, feeling bad for Alberto, feeling bad that his new best friend Luca has to leave him on a train only to come back once in a while. How's he gonna get by? How am I gonna get by without their friendship? I love this film. I think too many people slept on it. It does have a lull in the middle. It is very slow, but I think the payoff's worth it. Not quite infinity levels. It's close. I'm giving it a ka -chow. We're getting down to the wire here. Next up is Turning Red. The story of 13-year-old Mei Lin going through the change. Except puberty isn't her biggest problem. It's turning into a giant red panda. Uncomfortable to some 40-year-old men out there? Absolutely. Not this guy, though. I champion films like this that aren't afraid to take chances, tell new stories, give audiences new experiences. We've had four Toy Story movies. I'm over it. I'll take a turning red any day of the week, especially for what's coming next. But before we get to that, I have to praise the visuals here. The setting's great. These characters, these young girls are hilarious. Some may have found them annoying. That's 13 year old kids in general, full stop. But if you can appreciate their lightheartedness, their youthful innocence, their transition from kid to adult, then you should absolutely appreciate turning red. Also doesn't hurt that there's a fantastic boy band to listen to. I'm giving this a ka-chow. Lightyear. Yeah. My kids didn't even want to see this in theaters. They could tell it was going to be a boring piece of shit. It's not that bad. It's just not very good either, and I don't ever want to watch it again. So yeah, it's a put that thing back where it came from. I will say it's on Disney Plus now. My son watched it solo. I asked him what he thought. He said, no, not good, dad. Not good. He's 10. So I have to ask myself, who was this movie for? Because Andy, at the time of watching this movie in theaters with his mom or dad or by himself, I don't know the kid, I don't know his life and his struggles, he went to see Lightyear and the movie supposedly inspired him to go out and get the toy. The movie I saw that he saw was first off not the type of movie they would have made back then. Secondly, what in the hell kid would watch that stick in the mud and say, wow, Buzz Lightyear was awesome. The movie was chock full of inept characters that would sideline Buzz and make him look foolish for teaming up with these idiots. It was like the Scooby-Doo gang on Max Scooby Snacks, which isn't a good thing in this case. I know it helps Scooby, but let's be honest, the guy's a drug addict. He he's, he's not in a good space. Then there was the awful twist at the end with Zerg. Instead of it being his father, which sure, that might've been done for jokes just as a parody on Star Wars. It's him, older, bitter, stupid. It's like Pixar watched Interstellar and said, Let's just make that movie, but way worse. Again, they had the opportunity to be the Pixar I know and love. They could have thought outside the box and said, okay, Andy's seeing this in the theater. Let's make it look like a movie. Like how meta would that be if they made it look like a movie that came out in the 90s? It could have had cheesy effects and explosions everywhere. Total bro-tastic, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Transformers, G.I. Joe style action. Could have been a blast. But instead they made this humdrum sci-fi adventure that really didn't see him adventure anywhere. They're stuck on this planet that's not very interesting with characters that I want to kill. And the most exciting thing about it is a robotic cat. That's the lowest, cheapest form of comedy using a cute animal. How dare you, Pixar? You're supposed to be better than that. So let's take this film and put that thing back where it came from. Because I'm done, Lightyear. I'm done. I mean, look at this list. So many infinity level S tier, God tier films to choose from. 
and hardly anything at the way bottom. A couple in the middle, but overall, this is a win. This is an absolute win for Pixar. They need to keep innovating, keep trying new things, stop making sequels. They used to be a company that was like, we're not gonna do a lot of sequels. And then Disney got their grubby hands on them. I don't wanna see a third Incredibles movie in five more years, and it's just the same thing again, but Violet's the lead character, hard pass. Although I would like a Ratatouille sequel because then they could do the rat to tui rat to Ratatouille with the, the number, whatever. We're gonna move on. I gave you my tier list. Now I wanna hear yours below. Let me know what you thought about all these Pixar movies. Rank them if you want. I mean, I, it's your life. You can choose to waste it if you want to. I did. It's a good time. Like the video if you had some fun. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't. I post tons of movie and TV show related content each and every week. Would love to have you stick around. Now, if you excuse me, I'm gonna turn on Disney Plus. Who knows? Pixar might've already released three more movies without me even knowing it. Thanks again for watching the video. Since you made it all the way through this long thing, maybe think about joining me on some other platforms like TikTok at Adam Does Movies, Twitch, where I sometimes live stream these events and you can see all the outtakes, all the embarrassment. It's, it's right there at your fingertips to watch. And if you really like what I'm doing, become a member on Patreon at patreon.com slash Adam Does Movies or right here on YouTube via that join button. You get access to 300 plus exclusive videos now. It's, it's a great deal. I mean, it only costs you a dollar.